Hello, I am Peter Ogwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top story today is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where campaigning ahead of the de long-delayed presidential election is set to begin. But with a month to go to the polls, security and the outbreak of Ebola are expected to hamper the process. Five people, including children, are wounded as gunmen kidnap an Italian aid worker in southeastern Kenya. A year ago, celebration and relief in Zimbabwe as Robert Mugabe's rule came to an end. But how much is there to celebrate today? Life was tough, but better than this. Prices are just rising. What we used to buy with $2 now cost 10 or $10.75. Also in the program, back on the public stage, Archbishop Desmond Tutu in Cape Town to announce the winners of this year's International Children's Peace Prize. And in sports, crunch matches today for Nigeria and Equatorial Guinea in the Women's Africa Cup of Nations in Ghana. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. We begin in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where political parties are about to begin campaigning in just a few hours' time in the country's long-delayed presidential polls. Voters will choose a new president, a successor to Joseph Kabila. He is not standing, but has faced criticism for delaying the vote by two years. His ruling party has unveiled a five-year plan for the country promising to combat poverty and insecurity. But there's widespread frustration and uncertainty ahead of these elections. Our reporter, Louise de Wast, has more. Making his first public remarks since President Joseph Kabila picked him to represent his party, Emmanuel Ramazani Shadari pledged to triple government spending if elected. Presenting an $85 billion five-year development plan, Shadari told supporters he would diversify the economy, guarantee access to public services and restore security. Le vrai défi. Le vrai défi. The real challenge before us is not the lack of financial resources, but rather our ability to create wealth, mobilize it, and protect it from looting. The former interior minister, who is under EU sanctions, will be running against 20 other candidates, including opposition heavyweight Felix Tshisekedi. And today, opposition candidate Martin Fayulu making a comeback in the capital after meetings in Europe, hundreds lining the streets to greet him. <laughs> Insecurity is one of the main issues of concern, especially in the East. The Beni region is grappling with an Ebola outbreak thought to have killed more than 200 people since July, and the number of violent attacks from multiple armed groups active in the area is increasing. Insecurity affects all segments of the population. If you go and see, people are gone. Shops, health centers, Pharmacies have been looted. There's no more activity at the moment. This election has been postponed for two years now. Civil society and members of the opposition worry that more delays are possible. But for now, voters are expected to head to the polls on December 23rd. Louise Doast, BBC News, Dakar. Five people are recovering in hospital following an attack in the southeast of Kenya. Police say three children were injured and are treating it as a terror attack. A 23-year-old Italian aid worker was also kidnapped. Joining me in the studios is Wahiga Mwara, who has been following this developing story. Uh, what's the latest? Well, Peter, in terms of this developing story, what we know at the moment is that for the better part of the day, the Kenya police, together with the Kenya Defense Forces, have been combing that area, trying to find the Italian aid worker. That's what they've told us so far. And in terms of the condition of the five that were injured, they were actually injured when the attackers were leaving that village, the Chakama village, towards the southwest of Kenya. They're in hospital at the moment. They're in the HD unit, receiving treatment well. But uh, that is what we have in terms of particular updates. Now, it's been, what, six, seven, eight years since a foreigner was last kidnapped in, um, 
in Kenya, I mean, remember back then there was a spate of kidnappings. That's right, um, in 2011 and, yeah, especially. That's right. So are the authorities worried about this? Is this the beginning of, a, of another round of kidnaps? Well, until we know the motive of the attackers, it might be a bit early to actually speculate uh, whether this is a return to the days of 2011. You remember two big incidents back in 2011, the kidnapping of a French lady and she passed on, you know, during because of the ordeal and the kidnapping of a British couple as well. And all that put the Kenyan coastline in the news for all the wrong reasons. So when this news came out today, obviously many thought of that. For now, it's not possible to tell if there's a direct link, but as soon as the police can tell us who the attackers are, because we still don't have mm -hmm. the identity and their mission, then we can begin to see if whether this was just a local gang trying to make some money, as some news agencies have claimed, or whether you know it's a return to some of those worrying days. Uh, and this area in the southeast of the country, I mean, was it one of the parts where we saw these kidnappings happen seven years ago? No, it wasn't. It's actually further inland. We're talking about 80 kilometers or so from Malinda, which is the tourist hub. Uh, and obviously, you know that the Kenyan coastline has had its various issues, whether it's pirates in terms of kidnapping or terror as well. But uh, bad news spreads faster than good news. And so you can imagine that any tourist now that was going to Malindi, if you go to your computer and Google, the kind of headlines you'll read, it is a bit worrying. And so, you know, nobody ever wants a terror attack. But at a time like this, when many are thinking of traveling to other parts of the world to explore, these are not the kind of headlines that an area like that would need. And just quickly, um, how are the children doing? The children so far are in, I'm going to use the word stable condition because I don't have sort of the, each of the exact stats, but they, they're in a in HD unit and, you know, we certainly wish them the best. Um, but wait and see scenario is what I'm going to say for now. Well, Higa, great to have you on the program. Thank, Thank you, you very Peter. much there. Thank you very much. Now, let's take a quick look at other stories making the headlines across Africa. Reports from northeast Nigeria say dozens of people have been killed in a series of militant attacks in recent days. In one assault, more than 40 Nigerian soldiers, including a senior commander, are said to have been killed at a remote army base in Borno State. The violence has been blamed on a splinter faction of the Boko Haram Islamist group. All nine students and a teacher kidnapped from a school in English-speaking Cameroon have been freed. It happened after government troops raided a separatist camp in Kumba in the country's southwest region. And Morocco's second military surveillance satellite has been launched. Uh, Mohammed 6B, named after the king, blasted off from French Guyana in the early hours of Wednesday. It will be used for mapping, agricultural monitoring, natural disaster management, along with border and coastal surveillance. It's the optimism that millions of Zimbabweans had in the last year uh, beginning to fade. A year ago today, the sound of celebrations filled the streets as the country welcomed the fall of its autocratic longtime leader, Robert Mugabe. Then, Zimbabwe faced not only a political crisis, it was also on an economic and social precipice. So what, if anything, has changed in a year? The BBC's Shingai Nyoka reports from Harare. Zimbabweans savouring the moment, the end of an era. Robert Mugabe was no longer president. This is how 36-year-old Vimbai Nashe celebrated the departure of the only leader she had ever known. I have seen nothing but the worst in our country. I'm from Bulawayo and we did not want Mugabe at all. He is, he's the one who engineered the Gukura Wundi. We were tired of this man. We are so glad he's gone. We don't want him anymore. And yes, today it's victory. It's victory in our hearts. It, it's victory for our children. And it's still to be no. I'm so sorry. There he stepped down. I'm actually on seven. It's been a year without Robert Mugabe. On the anniversary of that momentous event, we sought her out to find out what, if anything, had changed. The new dispensation has brought in a certain level of freedom that we didn't have. And that's why right now I can stand here and have an interview with you and people are calm about it. There is some positives, but the main thing the currency, the economy, because we can talk about everything else, but we still need to leave as a people of Zimbabwe, don't we? And our children still need to go to school. This was the bustling capital under Mr Mgabe, overrun with vendors. Now an unfamiliar calm has settled over the capital. 
President Mnangagwa has claimed success, order, more jobs and fresh investor interest. But his rule has also ushered in the worst economic crisis in a decade, including a fuel crisis and food price hikes. His critics blame unprecedented government borrowing for the inflation. His administration has also been defined by this. Post-election protests that left six people dead and accusations of a cover-up. A sharp contrast to these November celebrations, it raised questions about whether citizens had been used to elevate another brutal regime. There is something that was ushered in, a new cultural climate that was ushered in by November 2017. And I don't think that this country will ever have another demigod uh, again. And that's part of what we're celebrating. So you will find that citizens are going to remain very skeptical of politicians. And that's why Munangago is having a tough time. Because people don't want to give him the same open check that they gave Mugabe over 37 years. Must be healed totally. Zimbabweans are still in search of healing, prosperity and deliverance. Some had hoped that the swift and smart coup could also bring about a quick turnaround. When Mugabe was leader, life was better. Life was tough, but better than this. Prices are just rising. What we used to buy with $2 now cost 10 or $10.75. Mr Mugabe, who for years was a symbol of Zimbabwe's ruin, is no longer in charge. It's now for those who forced him from power to prove that they are the solution to the problems many believe he created. Shingai Nyoka, BBC News, Harare. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwacha. Still to come, Mimi with all the sport as South Africa prepared to take on Equatorial Guinea in the Women's Africa Cup of Nations. I'm Peter Okwacha. The top stories this are. It's been announced that the delayed general election campaign in the Democratic Republic of Congo will begin on Thursday. Five people, including children, are wounded as gunmen kidnap an Italian worker in southeastern Kenya. Pay more attention to rising debt and diversifying your economy. That's the message from the International Monetary Fund about Nigeria and other sub-Saharan African countries. One of President Buhari's objectives when he came to power in 2015 was to move from over-reliance on oil to investing in agriculture and in solid minerals. So, has this been achieved? It's the question I put to the Nigerian Finance Minister, Zainab Ahmed. Remember that in 2015, that uh, we inherited a, a very weak economy with very weak fundamentals. And the president, since he was campaigning, had made a commitment that he was going to uh, govern the country based on uh, ensuring, th he made three promises to ensure that there's uh, security and the welfare of the people are taken care of, that he will grow the economy and he will fight corruption. One of the things that really annoys Nigerians, that irks Nigerians, is the fact that when you hold this government to test. It keeps on telling you, well, we inherited a weak economy three years ago. Uh, th there were no money in the coffers three years ago. I mean, three years down the line, shouldn't this government be doing better? Peter, look, there's no way you, you will make progress if you don't look at where you're coming from, because that's the path. What you inherited is your baseline, and you're building from there. Remember that our economy didn't always used to be down on its knees. And it didn't come down on its knees in, in, in two years or, or even three years. It was a process that took over 16 years. So you don't solve the problems that developed over 16 years in one, two, or three years. The problems are fundamental. I've been looking at some indices, and the Global Comparative Index uh, says that the ease of Niger doing business in Nigeria is actually getting more difficult. I mean, for Africa's largest economy, should that be the case? It should be easier to do business in Nigeria. We simply have to make Nigeria competitive so that our, our goods that are produced locally will be, not only be consumed in Nigeria, but we can export them and they can compete with, with other economies. We are happy with these measurements because it helps to spur everybody that is involved, including the, the private sector, to do more. 
a couple of weeks ago, you were quoted, and I actually watched the clip, uh, where you said the government was in consultation with traditional rulers and religious clerics on how to limit uh, the number of children Nigerians have. A few days later, you said what you meant was you wanted to engage Nigerians on how to space uh, their children. What exactly were you talking about? We have one of the highest ratios of um, a child to mother in, in, in the world today. At an average of 7.5, that is extremely high. We have a lot of families that cannot even feed the children that they have, not to talk about giving them uh, good health care or even giving them good quality education. So we have to talk about these things. Zainab Ahmed, Nigeria's finance minister there. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports. Mimi, football, football, and even more football. The Women's Africa <laughs> Cup of Nations. Very interesting day today. Crucial matches today in both games of the Women's Africa Cup of Nations in Ghana. Nigeria got a much-needed win to keep their hopes alive with a 4-0 thrashing of Zambia. That game just concluded. The other match of the day, which is due to start in just over 30 minutes' time, is South Africa against previous winners, Equatorial Guinea. Now elsewhere, BBC's Dabola Adebanjo, who is currently at the competition in Cape Coast, has been summing up for us Tuesday's fixtures. Now Cameroon did help themselves to a big win over Algeria, gaining six solid points and staying top of Group A. But Mali's shot the feet of host Ghana means they'll have to wait until the final day of group games to know if they are through to the semi-finals. Now this is because Ghana and Mali still have a shot at the semis if they both get wins, which will leave Ghana, Cameroon and Mali all on six points. And similarly, if Algeria and Cameroon do get wins over Ghana and Mali, it also means Mali, Ghana and Algeria all are tied on three points. Hence a shot at the semis, which eventually can be decided by goal differences, by goal scored in head-to-head -head against all three teams and could even go as far as a draw, handpicking who plays in the semi-finals. Former world marathon record holder Paul Tergad is a year into the job as president of the National Olympic Committee of Kenya. Tergad took charge of the body at a time when it was grappling with scandals related to funds following Rio 2016 Olympics. He's been speaking to the BBC's Celestine Caroné. Nothing has been easy all along. And I don't believe in anything easy. Even being an athlete, I sacrificed so much even in terms of my own family. It's been a challenge. So it is the same. A one-time rival of yours on the track and on the road in athletics, as well as a close friend, uh, Haile Gabriel Selassie, recently stepped down as president of uh, the Ethiopian Athletics Federation. Does this show the challenges that sportsmen face in making that transition from an active sports life into administration? I might not be able maybe to tell maybe the technicalities or the scenarios maybe behind it, but I want to say this again. All of us, we are very busy. Uh, we have our own businesses again, running beside whatever that we are doing. And uh, you s many people can be overwhelmed. So I don't know. Probably maybe because he has also other activities which are running uh, beside him, which are going to take much of his time, and maybe he decided maybe. But I might not be able to say exactly what met him. But again, uh, it is two sort of personal choices. Finally, all this week, we'll be profiling the five players that have made the 2018 BBC African Footballer of the Year shortlist. Today, we bring you Liverpool and Senegal's Sadio Mane. I love scoring for my team. Honestly, I love scoring for my team. This great season. Sadly, even we, we finally didn't move on something, but oh, this season, it's motivation for us to repeat it and try to go for it and win it. Very, very important goals for myself first, because I was struggling at the moment to score goal, and it boosted my confidence. I control with my right, and I turn immediately and shoot with my left, and it was amazing goal. <laughs> I scored Champions League final, very happy, but after the result is the more important. I scored the World Cup final, one of uh, my best day in so far in football, but and we was leading 1-0 up and the end 
It can be the best day in your life and sometimes worst day in your life. We were expecting to, to go far. We, we went out. Selon moi, c'est Allemagne, c'est un jour très technique. En, en défense ou en attaque, c'est un jour très technique. Et mes personnes, coach du Grand Club, il fait la fierté du peuple sénégalais et de l'Afrique. Of course, I'm very happy to be um, my fourth time nominated um, this African uh, Player of the Year. So, yeah, it's something who gave me more motivation to, 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 to keep working harder and harder, and hopefully, I'll yeah, win it one day. My name is Sadio Mane. I play for Liverpool and Senegal. Please vote for me, BBC African Player of the Year. We've got a great mix of shortlist for the players. We've got two North Africans and two defenders for the first time on the list, Peter. It's a very strong list, but, mm. you know, I reckon if I was playing football, I'd make that list as well. Keep dreaming. It's OK to dream. <laughs> <laughs> Many thanks, Mimi. Let's go to South Africa now, where Archbishop Desmond Tutu briefly came out of retirement last night to honour a group of young American students with the 2018 International Children's Peace Prize. Last February, the students were amongst survivors of a deadly shooting at their school in Florida. The BBC's Victoria Wahunda reports. <laughs> a jubilant Archbishop Desmond Tutu with his trademark laughter heading out to a ceremony to honor this year's International Children's Peace Prize. It is awarded annually to a child or children who fight for other children's rights. <laughs> you are just fantastic, you young people. The expert committee of the International Children's Peace Prize has decided to award the 2018 International Children's Peace Prize to the initiators of much for our lives. Archbishop Tutu praised the students for their youthful energy and unshakable belief that children must improve their own futures. These students are survivors of a high school gun massacre in Parkland, Florida earlier this year, which left 17 students and staff members dead. In just six minutes and 20 seconds, however, our town became the epicenter of the world as 17 hearts stopped beating one by one. 17 brothers, sisters, parents, friends, mentors, coaches, students were murdered in their classrooms and in our hallways. We know how to prevent this epidemic from continuing to plague our communities. We know what it's like to fear for our lives and therefore we will continue to fight so that gun violence can be a thing of the past. The group has been lobbying lawmakers for tighter gun control in America and organized one of the biggest marches in Washington in recent memory. With a spring in his step, the 87-year-old Nobel Peace Laureate, who has largely withdrawn from public life, danced and celebrated the evening, honoring a new, young crop of peace winners. Victoria Uwonghunda, BBC News. Archbishop Tutu's chuckle. I can never get enough of it. And it's great to see him out and about, isn't it? Just before we go, another look at our top story. Within the next few hours, political parties in the Democratic Republic of Congo are set to begin campaigning in the country's long-delayed presidential polls. And security and the outbreak of Ebola is expected to hamper the process. Voters will choose a successor to President Joseph Kabila. Don't forget you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Okwache, but for me and the rest of the team, thanks for watching. See you soon.